chose to join the Iona Project for three main reasons. I wanted to escape the busyness of a life dominated by reaction. I wanted to be pushed to live unselfishly. And I wanted to be a part of a community living life together as God intended. And since coming here, I have had the time to act with intention, the opportunity to live unselfishly, and the privilege to live life alongside my brothers and sisters. This year, however, has not been everything I imagined it would be. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer would say, it is the realized rather than imagined Christian walk that God is in, about, in and about, and I thank him for that. One surprise about this program happened at the very beginning. Instead of a checklist of things I needed to be able to do and a youth minister template I needed to embody, the Iona program starts with who each individual is and who they can become through the experience of Christian community, spiritual formation, and service toward others. This vision freed, inspired, and challenged me. Embracing the reality of a Christian community as one body with many parts, each in need of the other, we've had the opportunity to serve in the unique ways God works and manifests himself in each of us. Since our roles as Christians are dependent on our being, what we do flows from who we are. Although I came to Boys Ranch eager to serve and be used by God, I've had to learn not to assume God has any need for my doing. What he needs is my being. In order to act from a place of being and living in Christ, it is necessary to know yourself. Iona has helped me to look with honesty and growing clarity upon both myself and others. It has helped me to be aware of the false self that is fueled by the perception of others and always seeks to usurp the true self we fear isn't enough. However, it is not possible to know yourself without also knowing the one who created us. This year I read The Interior Castle by Teresa of Avila, a book about the spiritual life in which she compared the soul to a castle with many rooms, towers, and dwellings in which to explore and experience God. In it, she said, even though it is, even though it is by the grace of God that the soul practices knowing herself, you can, as the saying goes, have too much of a good thing. Reflecting on the virtue of God will carry us to much greater heights than if we were to tie ourselves down to our own little land of misery. Because humility is so essential to us, it is important to enter the room of self-knowledge first, instead of floating off to other places. And yet, we will never know ourselves unless we seek to know God. Glimpsing his greatness, we recognize our own powerlessness. Gazing upon his purity, we notice where we are impure. Pondering his humility, we see how far from humble we really are. The habits formed by the daily routine of prayer and repetition of scripture has impacted me in ways I'm still discovering. It has been for me spiritually what we learned regulatory activity is for children who've experienced trauma formative, healing, reminding. While my false self is shaped by the world, it is in these moments that my true, shelf, my true self is shaped by the Holy Word of God. I've also been shaped and changed through each member of this Iona community. In describing the unique quality of relationships with an intentional Christian community, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said in his book, Life Together, God did not make this person as I would have made him. He did not give him to me as a brother for me to dominate and control, but in order that I might find above him the creator. God does not will that I should fashion the other person according to the image that seems good to me, that is, in my own image. Rather, in his very freedom from me, God made this person in his image. I can never know beforehand how God's image should appear in others. That image always manifests a completely new and unique form that comes solely from God's free and sovereign creation. One of the valuable treasures of community life has been discovering God's image in each of my brothers and sisters in a form that does not exist in me, and also having my tr own true self be seen and addressed by others. 
As Alex once pointed out to me, we are not nearly as good at hiding our flawed and frightened selves as we think we are. This is particularly true when surrounded by people being taught to look past the false self and see the true self. Over time spent playing Dutch Blitz, <clears throat> Monday night dinners, road trips to the mountains, planning for Vine and Radical, and daily mornings of prayer together, the person assembled for the world to see each day breaks down and the angry, fearful, competitive, insecure, prideful, wounded souls, the true selves are exposed. But in that peeling away, we also get to know the genuine, tender, loving, giving, sacrificial, insightful, hopeful, timid true selves that are worth much more than the made-up false selves. I think this is also the heart of what Sama and LSCI teach us, to look beyond a child's aggressive and defensive false shell to see the ailing, true human soul hiding within. This type of seeing does not come with rose-colored glasses, however. True selves can be scarred, ugly, and beastly. One sign of growing in holiness is being able to find Christ's image in each of his children, no matter how distorted that image is. And the aim of ministry is to address that distorted image, the true self, and bring her into the light. Recently, I went to see the remake of my favorite Disney movie, Beauty and the Beast and was reminded of a profound lesson in that story. A thing must be loved before it is lovable. This simple thought has made me look on residents' angry outbursts and eye rolls in a new light. And each one is a bit of the beast, who as much as he might try, could not change without the transforming power of love on his being. I saw the beast in myself, so often doing just exactly what I do not want to do, and yet every moment of deeper conversion comes because while I was still unlovable, God loved and died for me. When I first came to Boys Ranch, I approached ministry by asking the wrong question. I wondered how I was going to offer something of convincing value to kids who had experienced a kind of trauma I never had. However, I've come to see that the fundamental question is not how do I minister to trauma-wounded youth, but rather, how do I, also a sinful and broken human being, experience healing and growth? During one of our Thursday morning spiritual formations with Chaplain Wilhelm, we read an excerpt on the human condition that shed light on this question. The author explained that humans thrive and grow toward their true selves through trusting relationships where God's unconditional, agape love meets hopeful expectancy creating the space where you are safe to be who you are right now, and yet also encouraged and inspired in an inner journey toward becoming the fullness of who you were created to be. What has been difficult about this in ministry and even in community is the time and patience required to build these relationships, to wait for the soil to be ready for growth. It has meant submitting to the task of planting seeds, even if it means we don't see the fruit. A couple of months ago, I was playing basketball with a resident and helping her with her shot. Each time she missed, her frustration increased, and with each piece of advice I gave, her anger directed at me escalated. No, that doesn't work. I can't do it that way, she yelled. I tried helping by modeling what I was talking about. No, you look like an idiot. I'm not doing that, she said. Everything I said, whether correction or encouragement, was responded to with another eye roll and another outburst. So, at a loss for how to redeem the situation, I was finally just quiet, silently rebounding each shot for her. And in that quiet, there was space for me to pray and invite God into the situation, asking him for patience and for eyes to see her as he sees her. We continued on in what began for me as awkward and tension-filled silence, but as God's peace filled me, it became less so. And as I turned to leave, I was surprised as she called out to me. Ma'am, she said, I love you. We read a metaphor in spiritual formation, that the soul is like a wild animal. In order to tame him, it takes patience, care, and time to allow a wild and skittish soul to come out and be seen. 
since that day playing basketball, I have seen the, how these kids have built walls to defend themselves, even from the things that will do them good. And until they decide to trust that they are safe, it is silent presence, patient bearing with them, and prayer that does far more than my advice and coaching. The famous theologian Karl Barth once said that the most beneficial test for his seminary students would be to visit them unannounced and simply ask, how goes it with your soul? Similarly, whenever we come across Chaplain Wilhelm, he puts his hand on his chest and asks, how are you doing in here? And every Wednesday during our meeting, he asks the chapel staff, <clears throat> where have you noticed God's grace breaking through this week? There are times when these questions bring me anxiety because I know I have not stopped to notice. I've been caught in the world's current and so finding an answer is like paddling upstream to find the things I'd missed. Though God's grace is everywhere, my eyes are weak and my attention strays. It is the daily immersion in scripture, prayer, and this Iona community that is the medicine that continues to cultivate eyes that see God's grace in every situation and his imprinted image in every child.